Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the Missing Pet Consultant course. We're happy that you're still with us. We're in the home stretch in course three, Becoming a Missing Pet Consultant, Effective Search Techniques. So these things are super important to know because whatever your line of work is, whether you work in a shelter, in a veterinary hospital, a pet store, or any kind of interaction you have with pet owners, you're going to want to have good advice for them because people will ask you for help no matter where you are. They will see you as an expert even if you're not necessarily totally focused on missing pets. If you're anywhere in the animal world, people will ask you for help on a variety of subjects. So it's important for you to have good, accurate information and to be able to advise people. And if it's appropriate for your role, you may also be able to physically assist them. Say if you're a volunteer, if you're able to go out into the community and help people, maybe someone who is elderly or disabled who's not able to do certain things, things, you can actually go out and help them. So you will really make a difference in someone's life. So we'll talk a little bit about cats versus dogs, although some methods work for both because of the different behavior of cats and dogs that we've discussed in this course. You're going to want to take some different approaches to looking for them. Now with cats, people tend to go outside, call the cat, look around, shake a bag of food or tap on a can. And while that may work with a super friendly outdoor cat that just got distracted and he comes back to his home, if it's truly a missing cat, an indoor cat that got out and is frightened, an outdoor cat who is injured or ill, has been attacked by an animal, any number of things has happened, or if they're not that close to home, that's not going to work. They're not going to respond. So you're going to have to get down to the nitty gritty and look a little harder than that. So the number one way of finding a cat is a close physical search of the immediate area. And we'll talk about this a lot more in detail in our next and final week, the physical search for both a cat and a dog. But we'll touch on it a little bit today. This kitty in the picture is Squeakers. And Squeaker's owner's mother recently passed away. And God bless her, unlike many people who would have just dropped the cats off at the animal shelter, she actually took care of her mother's cat. So she drove from her home to her mother's home, which was about five hours away. And in addition to having to deal with her arrangements and funeral and cleaning out the house, she also took her three, it was three or four cats that were all related. So she put them in the car and carriers, drove them all the way back home, got home, opened the back of the car, and Squeakers had gotten out of the carrier, which was actually some kind of a dog crate. And away she went. And the owner was terrified. She called us and I counseled her over the phone for several weeks. And following our advice, she was able to determine that Squeakers was still in the area, as you can see in the picture on the left. So she put out food and water for her. And she also put out a bed that her mother and sister, the other cats, had been sleeping on, so in the hopes that would attract her. And ultimately, she was able to trap her using a humane trap, because although she would hang around, she could not get close enough to pick her up. And she didn't want to leave the door open to the house because then the other cats would get out. So Squeakers is, is a success story. Uh, the owner was persistent and didn't stop looking and understood the concept that many cats will really stay close to home, even though she had never been there before. It's just untypical of cats who want to travel very far away. So some things when you're searching a physical area, safety first, okay. So in some parts of the country, if you wander onto someone's property, they might pull a gun on you. Uh, there might be any number of safety hazards that you may run into. People may call the police. When Squeaker's owner was looking for her, most of the neighbors in the community knew what she was doing, but some didn't, and they saw a woman climbing around outside at night with a flashlight, so they called the police. Fortunately, when the police came, they were quite understanding when she explained the situation, and then she introduced herself to the neighbor 
and there was no problem. But it's important to realize this, especially when an owner is upset and they're trying to just get something done. They're often just like a person who will run out into traffic to save a dog. They're not thinking of their own safety. You want to be aware of your surroundings, know where you are. If possible, you know, have somebody else with you and during the day, although sometimes you have a better chance of finding animals at night. But as I said, we'll talk about this more next week. So another good way to look for a cat is to notify your neighbors. Since cats are a little more sneaky than dogs, you may not see them. They're not necessarily going to be walking down the street announcing their presence. But your neighbors will see and notice, even if they're not animal people. They'll notice that they saw a cat sitting in front of their house or at the park or something like that, especially maybe a cat they haven't seen before. It'll catch their eye. So Zant here in the picture went missing near my home here in Northern California. And the owner searched for him. He was an indoor cat who got out. And she created these cards. And it looks like a flyer in the picture, but it's actually like a postcard sized card. And those are the two sides of it. She had those made at a local print shop. And you can have these made at a place like that, or there's always Vista Print online. It's very cheap, very fast turnaround if you don't have a local print shop. So what she did was when she got some calls as to possible sighting, she would then distribute these little cards to all the homes that were sort of closer to that sighting. And ultimately, it did lead her to find her cat because he ended up going in a direction that was not the direction she thought he went. She was kind of near a park in an open space, sort of assumed he went that way. It turns out he went the other way towards downtown. So she was able to find him. And actually what happened one night was she went out looking for him in the area where there had been sightings on foot, walked home, and that night he came home. So we don't know for sure, but we think it's possible because we've heard of this happening before that he followed her scent, that he either saw or heard or smelled her when she was looking for him, and then he followed her trail back home. So that's how she got Zant. So there's a lot of places where you can distribute these materials. You can just go door to door. You can do the post office every door direct, which is a method that will blanket an area in one day. You can choose one neighborhood. You can choose the whole city. just depends on how much money you want to spend and how large of an area you want to cover. Obviously, for cats, it's probably going to be a small area. So you just pick the postal route that is right around the home where the cat went missing. Homeowners associations, clubs, if you have the Lions Club, Kiwanis, any of those beneficial organizations, any clubs that meet and do kind of social work in your area, they'll be happy to assist you. Many of them will also live in the area, so they will also keep an eye out. So the more eyes you have on your search, the better. So the microchip, and as I'm sure I've talked about a hundred times already, we were so thrilled when microchips first came out and we thought they would solve all the problems of the world and they did not. However, that's no reason to not continue to promote them and to encourage everyone to microchip and register their pet. So if the pet is already missing, if the owner has the number, if they have some document, whether it's their adoption paperwork or perhaps at the veterinarian, it might be in the computer, on the receipt, if they went to one of those roadside clinics, it may be in their records if they don't have the paperwork. It's really ideal if they still have the number so they can call the company and check and make sure that it is registered. Because half the time when you ask people, first of all, they don't even know that their pet has a microchip. And then if they do, you ask them if it's registered and they say, oh, I think so. <laughs> so super important for them to call the registry. Found Animals is one that we work with because they're a nonprofit and their products are very, very inexpensive and accessible for other nonprofits like shelters and rescues. But there are a number of other organizations that sell chips and maintain registries. So it's important to make sure that the chip is registered with the registry from which it was purchased, say AKC or Home Again or Avid, 
And found animals is also a free registry, so if the owner isn't sure, they can always register it again on found animals. It's free and super easy to do online. You don't have to fill out paperwork and send it through the mail like you did in the old days. And also, many people think it's a GPS. So that's we have some educating to do. And there are some GPS callers that are out there now that we're learning about in the hopes of sharing that information with people. But that's a very different system than a microchip, which is a permanent lifetime form of ID, whereas the callers are awesome, but they're like a cell phone. They have a battery. They have to be charged frequently. And it's a whole different deal than the microchips. So super important when you're helping an owner that they make sure that chip is correctly registered and that they understand how it works. So again, think critically. As the owner, as you helping the owner, you want to use logic just like you would to solve any other problem. Is the, does the cat live strictly indoors? And many people will say, yes, they do. And you have to make sure, OK, they never go outside. Because some people will say, well, they go on the balcony, or they go out in the backyard a little, little bit. OK, that's different. But let's say the cat never, ever goes outside. It's an indoor cat only. And you can't find them. So logically, they might still be in the house. So let's start by looking there. Also, if the cat is outside, and it's a large area, and there's a lot of agriculture. Okay, There could be other cats. Cats like to hang around farms because there are mice and rats that they like to hunt. Many farmers and ranchers will feed cats for that purpose. So you're just going to use logic and look at the whole situation. You're going to advise the owner you need to check at the shelter. Okay, Even though most cats are found close to home, that doesn't mean he's not at the shelter. And so let's check, let's check off all the ways that we need to search so you're most likely to get your cat back. Okay, so watch out for scams. We've talked about this a little bit already. There's unfortunately some unethical people out there who want to either get money or they are just sick people and you know the same people who used to do crank calls back in the days before caller ID that they just want a laugh and they just want to hurt people. So they will call and claim that they have your pet, claim all sorts of things, and it's just ridiculous. And don't believe myths and quick fixes. Just like in every other part of life, quick fixes usually don't work. If it's too good to be true, like your mother probably told you, it probably is. So take every advice with a grain of salt. So here's some of the myths. Some of these we've talked about already, the dirty cat litter box, which will just not go away. People really want to believe that if they put a dirty litter pan outside, the cat will magically appear. And since we know now that most cats are pretty close to home, so they're not actually lost. They're not like Hansel and Gretel lost, where they have to find their way back home through a trail in the forest. They are hiding. They are frightened. They could be across the street. And a dirty litter pan is not going to bring them back. Somebody posted this online on some forum and said that one of the claims is that the cats can smell it from a mile away. <laughs> Someone else commented, humorously, if your cat can smell the litter box a mile away, maybe that's why he's not coming home. Okay, so. Uh, one of the other things we hear a lot is my cat went away to die. This is another myth. And this unfortunately prevents people from looking for their cat who may be trapped in the garage. And so this may be a healthy cat who needs to be rescued. Or it could be an elderly cat, which is often when they believe that they've quote unquote gone away to die. And the cat may be ill and suffering and need medical care, or may be at the point where they need to be humanely euthanized, but not just left outside to die by themselves because they're in such poor condition. Another one is that my cat was killed by a wild animal. And while this certainly happens, it's actually pretty uncommon. And in some areas, like in Southern California, it does happen. It's documented that coyotes attack pets and people. Because over the generations, they've become so habituated to living with people. And there's so much development that there's so many people, so many pets, and so many coyotes trying to share the same 
territory that pets are part of their diet. But in most of the country and in other countries, it's not that common. So while it certainly can happen, it's not an assumption that you should make. And also sometimes when remains are found, it could also mean that the animal died some other way and then was consumed by other animals. And many animals eat carrion. So this is also another possibility. We had a case where we assisted with an elderly Rottweiler who went missing while on an off-leash walk. The dog just kind of disappeared and wasn't found. And eventually, the owner was able to find some remains. And unfortunately, it looks like the dog kind of wandered away and maybe, we don't know, but maybe had a seizure or some kind of a medical event and probably died that same day that he went missing because there was no sign of him, not one sighting, nothing. And this was a big dog. He would have been seen by someone in the area. And unfortunately, we think that he might have passed away just due to his age and health, but very little was found of the body, but it was a couple of weeks later. So it's pretty unlikely that something like a coyote or a raccoon would kill a Rottweiler, elderly though he may have been, but more likely that they fed on the remains after he had passed away. So in any case, these are all things that make people not look and not go to the shelter, and that's the real danger of it. So we talked about the psychics already people claiming to have the pet and demanding money. So these are all things that owners are going to be up against that they need to be skeptical. Although when they are upset and looking for their pet, they're going to be a lot more gullible to believing these things. It's just like those emails you get from Nigeria saying that they want to put a million dollars in your bank account, that it, people must believe it or they wouldn't keep doing it. So let's talk a little bit about dogs. And again, some things are going to be the same. You know, the common sense, the logic, the avoidance of the scams. But other things are going to be more specific to dogs. And I'll give you some information in general today. But you also want to think when you are helping someone about the type of animal it is. We've talked about the personalities, just very basic personalities, like a dog that's really skittish and shy or that's super outgoing or one that gets out all the time, or one that is running scared. So those kind of give you an idea of how the dog will behave. But you also want to think about like the case of the elderly Rottweiler. Like obviously we surmise that that dog didn't go very far. Whereas if it were a two-year-old husky, he could be in the next town before you realize he is missing. So factors like that, the dog's size, the dog's breed, the dog's age, will definitely make a difference in how far they can go, who they might go with, who might want to pick them up. We have noticed that sometimes dogs that are cuter or appear more friendly may be picked up more quickly, whereas a dog that looks aggressive, not necessarily behaves aggressively, but maybe it's a dog that people perceive might be aggressive, they're probably not going to approach it, often with the bigger dogs, the bigger mixed breeds. So these are all factors to think about. So one of the things we recommend are posters. And there's different ways to do this. People recommend different ways of making these posters. This is one that we use with the bright colors so pe people can see it from the road. You will notice, now that we've talked about it, as you're driving around, you'll see missing pet posters. And typically from the car, you can't read it. You just see that little white square, and you kind of maybe see a picture that might be an animal. But you can't see the words unless you pulled over and came up close and took a good look at it. So while that type of flyer might work, say, for a billboard at the pet hospital, it's not the best thing for the side of the road. So you want to think big blocky letters simple language like this example here that's up at an animal shelter in their lost and found department. Gray female pit bull. Okay, you're going to remember that pink collar. Very obvious. If you see a gray pit bull with a pink collar, you're going to think, hey, I saw a sign that said that. So you want them to be highly visible, basic, with a phone number. You can put a picture on it or not. The text is the most important part. 
You also want to think about obeying local laws because you don't want to cause trouble with your law enforcement. In some areas there are sign ordinances, so you're not supposed to put signs out on public areas, on telephone poles, and so forth. So find out what the laws are in your area so you don't spend a bunch of time and money on signs only to have them taken down or to get a warning from the city. But usually you can put things that aren't offensive on your own private property or the private property of others. If you're in San Francisco or a place with lots of housing that's close together, you can put them in those big windows on the front of your flat or apartment or townhome so that it's visible to the street. Obviously, you want them to be pretty large depending on how far away the street is. You can, If you're in more of a, a subdivision area, you can put them on your front lawn using those signs like politicians use that say vote for so-and-so. It's like a little wire frame. You can get those left over and stick your sign on the front of it. After the election, they usually have lots left over that they just throw away. So hang on to a couple of those and use them for the missing pets. So you're going to find different ways of getting the word out and making it known that the pet is missing, but again, while still following the law. So calming signals, if you're into dog behavior at all, you've probably heard of Tour Brugas, I'm sure I'm saying the name terribly wrong, who wrote this book about calming signals. And there are also calming signals for cat. If you've studied Jackson Galaxy or any of that stuff, you may know about closing your eyes and blinking and different kinds of body language that is calming and non-threatening to cats or dogs. Now, unfortunately, our natural desire when we see a dog, especially one that's running down the street, what does your average person do? They stare right at the dog, square off, walk straight towards the dog, shouting, clapping hands, maybe clapping on your leg, making all kinds of noise. Now think about that from the dog's point of view. That's very frightening. Staring is threatening. Squaring your shoulders and walking directly towards them is threatening. Making loud noises is threatening. The likelihood of that dog coming up to you, even if it's your own dog, is pretty low. They're probably going to skedaddle off some other way. So it's very important to understand calming signals, especially when you're dealing with dogs that are skittish or have been out for a long time. We recently talked to someone who finally was able to capture a dog who had been on the run for almost two years. And this dog had been living in a golf course area and, and finding food or eating at people's houses, but nobody could get near her. They tried giving her sedatives. That didn't work. They tried putting a trap. Nothing worked for all this time, but this one person just continued to speak softly to her, to give her food, and to earn her trust. And it took many months. The dog one day just walked into her house like it was her dog. So pretty amazing how this stuff works, but it takes the time that it takes. And if you rush, you kind of lose the ground that you have gained. So some of the things, and I highly recommend that you read this book or any other articles about it, you want to get low. You don't want to be towering over the dog. You're going to speak softly, not shouting, not clapping your hands. Pretending to eat is a big one. All dogs love to eat. I've never had a dog who wouldn't steal food at every opportunity from the plate, from the floor, or from the garbage can. So having any kind of food or a snack, even if you have a protein bar or a bag of chips or something, just grab it and make a fuss about it. And dogs know. They know what packages are. They know what candy bars are. They know what it is when we're eating something. And that will get their attention, and it's non-threatening. So you want to get the word out online, especially for dogs. Now, it's not to say that this doesn't work for cats. It certainly does. But because cats usually don't travel far and they're not that visible, it tends to be a lot more effective for dogs. So all kinds of social media, Facebook, Instagram, there's plenty of others that I don't know about that are out there. Get the word out. Focus on more local pages for your county, your city, 
the buy and sell pet pages and so forth, the shelters, adoption pages, wherever you can, get the word out for people to be on the lookout. Next door is super effective for missing pets. I swear every day I see something on next door about people losing and finding pets because it's hyper local. For example, one person in my neighborhood said, I'm missing my cat, black cat with no tail. Pretty obvious. Someone said within a day, oh, he's in my yard. And that person was like across the street. But <laughs> the owner didn't know, and the cat just decided to hang out there for a while. So otherwise, he would have been looking all around. He wouldn't have known where the cat was. So again, the, the more hyper-local sites can be a lot more effective. Although dogs can travel or be taken in a car, so this does complicate matters, but you want to start local and maybe to like neighboring cities or the neighboring county. Just like with cats, think critically. Assess the situation. Learn about the dog's behavior and lifestyle. Does the dog always go for a walk to a certain place? Well, the dog might go that way because that's, in its habit, does the dog like to get in cars, etc. Learn about the behavior and you can better assess the situation. Again, with the myths and the quick fixes are probably not going to work. And understanding that dogs behave differently than they do at home. People have a hard time believing this, but they see it when they're out there calling their own dog and the dog is running the other way. So some of the myths are putting out dirty laundry. Now that's not to say that a dog wouldn't be attracted to that. My dogs will certainly love nothing better than to tip over the laundry hamper and sleep on a pile of dirty clothes, probably because it has our smell on it. But again, if the dog is miles away or injured or trapped somewhere, the scent of your laundry at your house is not going to be an incentive. If they could get back home and wanted to, they would do so with or without the laundry. So many people say, my dog ran away. Well, dogs don't run away from home. They're not like the characters in the old cartoons with the satchel and the stick over their shoulder. Something has happened. Dogs get out. They start exploring. Then they get lost. Or maybe they're looking for food or they're looking for a mate or something like that. Or they suddenly realize they don't know where they are. Or maybe they were frightened, attacked, hit by a car, any number of things. But it's pretty rare for a dog to just run away because they don't want to be there anymore. Uh, many people think their dog was stolen. Now, in some cases, it certainly is true. And this tends to be more likely with a dog that is more desirable or easier to sell. And we tend to see that it's more likely that dogs were stolen if it's say, a, a small dog, a purebred, a Pomeranian, a Maltese, a Yorkie. Yorkies are a hot item. People get thousands of dollars for them. So things like that. But if it's just kind of your average big dog, mixed breed, less likely you're going to be able to flip a dog like that on Craigslist. Although we did recently get involved in a case of a bull terrier, a Spuds McKenzie big head bull terrier that was stolen and the owner didn't think the dog was stolen. They thought the dog went missing. They posted looking for her. Fortunately, one of our people was astute and watching the local pages. She found literally the same day an ad for the dog that said the dog was for sale and, and that she could be used for breeding because it was a female. And that was the same dog, very distinctive looking dog. There's not a lot of bull terriers running around in the same color. So fortunately, she actually called the people, the volunteer called the people and pretended that she wanted to buy the dog just to sort of stall them and get the information. And then the owner was able to go and get her dog back. I don't know the details of how that went down or if there was any consequence, but she was just happy to get her dog back. So these things do happen, but they're less common. So you don't want to assume that. You want to cover all your bases when the dog goes missing. Think of what's the most likely thing that happened. And again, with the scams, demanding money, the truck driver, there's a new texting thing now that just came out a couple of weeks ago where they're texting you and saying that 
they need you to put money in a Bitcoin account or some other type of account or, or send them money through Western Union because these things can't really be tracked. It, it's a typical sign of scammers to use money wiring rather than just you know, sending a check or something like that. So if there's anything fishy about it or they start asking for money, you can pretty well assume that it's a scam unless they can provide you with the current picture. If they can take a picture of your dog right there and send it to you, then there's a chance they have your dog. Other than that, it's absolutely a scam. So I just put a few things under other search methods because they're less common and they're maybe not the most effective, but they are things that you do want to think about. So one is a radio or TV spot. And this can be a blessing and a curse. And we've known some people who've done this. And you can often get a thing like this as a PSA, so they won't charge you for it. It's just a you know, public service announcement, either on your local radio stations, whether it's music or talk radio, TV, usually the local channels, the ones that are you know, not um, the big networks or something like that, but your sort of local channels, cable channels, even internet channels now. So there's a possibility that you can do that. You will get the word out to a lot of people. The problem is that these people could be over a broader area than what you need. The good thing, especially with a dog, is that someone may know something. And we've seen cases where the dog was picked up by someone who just found the dog and then moved to another area. So they didn't even know that the dog was missing. They just kept it. So in any case, this can be good. The downside is that you don't necessarily want to say the exact location where the pet went missing because you will get hordes of people coming out trying to quote unquote help. And we have seen this be very detrimental. It's the same with, you've seen it with disasters, with oil spills where you get just all these people showing up and there's no coordination, the people are not working together, there's no sort of incident command system. And so it's really not helpful. Plus if a lot of people are chasing the dog, they can drive them out into traffic. So use this one carefully and give a general area, but be super clear that you don't want people to catch the dog. They are not to try to chase or catch the dog. Just to call, give them a number that they can call at any time or text. Newspaper, kind of the same thing. This is the old days. The most newspapers would do lost pet ads and they often did it for free or cheap. Some people still do it. You'll see it in the classified section of the newspaper. So if it's free, why not? Or if you call, especially a very local newspaper, not for a major city, but a smaller paper that's looking for content, you can ask them for help. And they may put a little ad or they may even run a little piece if they have some space that day or that week for some content. So it doesn't hurt to ask. But again, the caution about giving folks an exact area where the pet went missing and being very specific about what you'd like people to do if they see the pet and what not to do. So car tagging is something that can be helpful. The, there's some more information about this on our website about the kind of pens that you can use to, to do this. It's the same that you would use to write just married or graduated from high school or something like that. So it's very visible. And again, especially for a dog, if you're driving around, it gets people's attention. It doesn't necessarily mean that they will find the dog, but I know when I was teaching a class and we did this on my vehicle, my hatchback, just for an example, in the days that I drove around afterwards, I had all sorts of people coming up to me saying, oh, I'm sorry, your dog's missing. And it wasn't even my dog, it was a local case. I'm so sorry. And they would read it and they would look at it. And now everybody has a phone with a camera, so you can just tell them, hey, just take a picture of it and save the information. You don't have to write the numbers down like you used to. So this can be helpful, but again, it depends on where you're driving. If you're driving far out of the area, probably not going to be helpful. But if you drive a lot around your own town to go shopping, to go to work, or what have you, this could be helpful, and it certainly can't hurt. 
So the main thing is to get the word out. With all these different methods, you want the more eyes on your search, the better. So it's getting the word out and making sure people know what to do when they see your pet. Making sure that they have a number that they can contact you at any time. And when people do this, they are much more successful in getting their pet back and getting them back quickly.